Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Imagine for a moment, you're one of the best tennis players in the world, that you're playing for your country, and on the other side of the court is the player regarded as the number one player in the world. The pressure to beat him is intense. Now, imagine the pressure you would feel knowing that if you lost the match, that the Gestapo is in the crowd and is just waiting to see you fail and take you back home to face the Fuhrer himself, Hitler. Next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, the story of the man who lived that experience and so much more. The story of a true hero during one of the most horrific periods in history. The story of Gottfried von Kram. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you've decided to tune in for what I think is one of the most fascinating stories we have ever done, the story of Gottfried von Kram. When you go back through the annals of history, sports history, and you examine those who had to overcome huge odds or those who faced uncertainty or adversity, few can claim to have dealt with the same kind of pressure as von Kram. He was one of the best tennis players in the world. But he was playing at a time when Hitler was rising into power. He knew it. Half of Germany knew it. But the rest of the world was not yet in tune with what Hitler was going to do. Before we get to today's edition of Sports Forgotten Heroes and the story of Gottfried von Kram, I'd like to tell you that today's podcast is sponsored by Audible. With Audible, you get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Audible is a great way to show your support for Sports Forgotten Heroes and a terrific way to listen to your favorite books. Give it a try free at www.audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. I also invite you to visit the Sports Forgotten Heroes Patreon page at patreon.com backslash sportsfh. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash sportsfh. New content is posted there every day. Quizzes, this day in sports history, more information about our guests and the heroes we discuss, and it's also a great way to show your support for Sports Forgotten Heroes. Again, that's patreon.com backslash sportsfh. Follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at Sports F Heroes. Look for our page on Facebook or visit Sports Forgotten Heroes on the web at sportsfh.com. So why was Von Krom so terrified of Hitler? He had two strikes against him. First, he was Jewish, and second, he was a homosexual. Now, while we know Germany had a rather large Jewish population, during the 20s and 30s, a large homosexual population lived there as well, and neither fit into Hitler's image of a perfect race. However, as long as von Kram kept on winning, the Gestapo and Hitler were okay with him because it still helped to prove that Germans were superior. Now, rather than take you through the whole story myself, joining us once again on Sports Forgotten Heroes is author Marshall John Fisher. Hey, Marshall, welcome back to Sports Forgotten Heroes. I am so glad you decided to come back, and I hope you're doing well. Doing fine and great to be back. Thanks. 
Hey, you know, last time you were here, we spoke about Don Budge. Today, I want to talk to you about the man he played in one of the most riveting Davis Cup matches ever played. And a guy whom I think you can truly call a hero, Gottfried von Krom. Now, I'm yeah. guessing that almost everyone in my audience has never heard of Von Krom. So let's start here. Can you tell me a little bit about him? Who was he? Yeah, Gottfried Von Krom um, was uh, a German aristocrat um, born in uh, 1909 and uh, d- decided early on he wanted to be a tennis champion. Uh, his father had built him a court at his at their mansion, and he uh, he fell in love with the sport. And he was certainly a great athlete and became Germany's number one player. And for several years, he was without a doubt the number two player in the world, in, at least in the amateur game, which at that time was the uh, the, the glory game. I and mean, all the all the big tournaments in Davis Cup were all amateur. Sure. And he was number two. And he was number two. He won the French championships a couple times. Was in the finals of Wimbledon three times in a row, but never quite won it. And uh, but he was. He was not only the second best player, but uh, certainly the most popular player in the world. He was very good looking and charismatic and known for his incredible sportsmanship. And uh, the fans just loved him all over the world. So he was more popular at that time than Don Budge? Oh, yeah. Well, he was uh, a little older, first of all. And um, so he had, he had uh, as I say, won the French. And he had, he had been in the finals of Wimbledon and won the French before Budge was even on the world scene. Um, but yeah, even after Budge became number one, um, at, in 1937, I would say Von Krom was still the most popular player. Yeah. What was the world like in 1937 for Von Krom? And why was this one match, this Davis cup match so important for him? Yeah. Um, Von Krom, uh, had married uh, a childhood friend in his early 20s, and they were sort of a famous couple in Berlin. But he uh, was hiding a secret all the time, which, is, in fact, he was gay. And um, at that time, of course, <clears throat> it was not uh, not accepted at all. And so he kept it a secret, as many people did. And um, he, uh, but he did have some affairs, especially one particular affair with a, a, a not just a gay man, but a Jewish man in the 30s after the Nazis had come into power. And, you know, the Nazis, of course, weren't just um, uh, deporting Jews to concentration camps. There were also all other groups, including homosexuals. They were particularly hard on homosexuals. And, and, so and, Berlin, was being... and Berlin was a place that was very popular for homosexuals yeah. at that time. It had been, yeah. In, uh, in the 1920s, definitely. Um, that was true. And uh, they had uh, many, many gay bars and a uh, thriving homosexual lifestyle, um, very open but once Hitler came into power in '33, that all just disappeared, um, and yeah, suddenly everyone had to go into hiding. And so he was kind of um, living a secret life, and all, the Gestapo knew about him, and uh, but they were not not uh, arresting him yet because, for one thing, he was an aristocrat with great connections, which helped him a lot. Um, but also, he was their most famous athlete, really, of any sport, hmm. uh, except for maybe Max Schmeling. And um, they desperately wanted to win the Davis Cup, which at that time was a huge thing in sports. And Germany had come close but never quite won it. So they kind of made it clear to him that as long as he kept winning and he was giving them a chance to win the Davis Cup, they weren't going to bother him. Um, But that obviously put an enormous amount of pressure on him. Now, he wasn't just a great tennis player, but because of what the world around him was, and in reading your book, I think in the end, you could have called him a great humanitarian based on what he did for so many. He yeah. Is yeah. that a fair yeah. thing to say? And tell us a little bit about the types of things he did for others. Yeah, well, he was—he really was a remarkable person, um, and he—he uh, he, uh, well, for one thing, he—he he went he, at great risk to himself. He helped his his uh, lover Manfred um, Herbst to get out of the country, and 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 in fact, what he was—he eventually was arrested, and it had to do with financial matters because he allowed his friend to take—he gave him money to take out and helped him take it out of the country, which was illegal 
during the Nazi regime. Um, but he also, you know, after this, after the match, the famous match of 37, which my book centers on, he, after that, he uh, left the country. But then when the war began, he came back of his own volition to serve, even though he hated the Nazi government so much, he loved his country and he went and served on the Russian front as a private, even though he was an aristocrat right. and somehow survived all that. And he survived the Holocaust and even, um, even did some work during the war when he was not after he was out of the war, but the war was still going on. He did some work, uh, helping, helping, uh, Jews and other people. And also, um, doing a little, even a little bit of possibly a bit of espionage. Interesting. We're going to come back to some of that, but before we go on to talk about the Davis Cup match between Von Krom and Don Budge, some say it was the greatest match ever played. Uh, a few notes for our listeners. Von Krom had just lost in the finals of Wimbledon to Budge just a few weeks earlier. Budge was, at that time, ranked as the number one player in the world, and Von Krom, had it not been for Budge, might have been number one. As you said earlier, he just couldn't get over the hump of winning at Wimbledon. Now, Bill Tilden, who was arguably the greatest tennis player of all time at that time, was sort of exiled from American tennis, and he wound up coaching Von Krom and the Germany Davis Cup team. This match was an inner zone final between Germany and the U.S., and it was being played at Wimbledon. And at the time, the world, I guess, really didn't know what Hitler was about or about to do. And the fans in the stands were pulling more for von Krom than they were for Budge. So let's start here. Tell me about the relationship or friendship that Von Krom and Don Budge had? Was there one? Well, Krom and Budge, yeah, they were pretty good friends. Um, when Budge first came up, uh, uh, Krom actually took him aside in a famous <laughs> famous incident that after after Budge had won uh, a match in Wimbledon and they were going to play in the next round in, in the semifinals, I think. <clears throat> and Krom said, you know, Don, I just wanted to tell you, I didn't think you were very sportsmanlike out there today. And Budge was stunned because he thought he was a fine sportsman, you know. <laughs> And and Krom explained to him that you know there was a point where uh, the linesman made a bad call, and Don Budge did what he had seen Tilden do, which is throw the next point because the call had been in his favor. So he threw the next point to make it even, and Krom uh, admonished him and said, uh, you know, that's really that's not very good sportsmanship because you made the lines person feel terrible. Wow. You know, so let's just play the play the play the calls the way they're called, you know. <laughs> so he was very famous for things like that. Just, it's great, uh, great uh, sportsmanship. And so, but after that, he and Budge became quite good friends. Um, and so when they played, well, as you say, first they played Wimbledon in 37 and Budge beat him soundly um, to become world champion. And then two weeks later, they're playing again for the, even, even really a bigger match because this was going to determine the Davis Cup, which at that time was bigger than Wimbledon. And um, so, yeah, they were good friends, and no one certainly thought uh, Von Krom had much of a chance. Did Budge have any inclination, any inclination at all, as to how important this match was for Von Krom? Do you think, knowing how important it was, there might have been a different outcome, even based off of what you just said with Budge throwing a point? In a previous match, yeah. do you think he might, had he known how important this match was for Gottfried von Krom, maybe well, he wouldn't have done yeah, what I, he did? Don Budge uh, certainly did not know everything that was going on behind the scenes. Um, and uh, who knows? I mean, you know, m many years later, he, he mused about how maybe it would have been better if he had lost the match. But uh, I don't think he would have. But tried any less hard, you know, he had a lot of pressure on himself because the U.S. hadn't won in a few years. Everyone in you know, the whole country's hopes were pinned on him. He was the key to winning the Davis Cup, and so I can't imagine he would have played with anything less than 100. percent But uh, certainly, he knew he knew it was a big match, important for Crown. But I don't think he knew everything that was going on. Hmm. Uh, last time you were here, we talked a lot about the uh, strengths and weaknesses of Don Budge's game. Tell me about the strengths and weaknesses of Gottfried von Krom's game. 
Well, uh, von Kron was what we now would probably call more of a clay court specialist. Um, and in fact, he did much better on clay, which he had grown up on and, and won the French championships twice on clay. Um, but in fact, you know, tennis was a little different then. And even, even he, although he loved clay courts, he still was pretty attacking. He, he did serve in volley some, um, he had a great, just a great all around game. Everything was, everything was good about his game. He was very famous for his American twist serve, which is a big, big spin serve. The American twist is where you kind of <clears throat> toss it to your left and give it a big top spin that bounces off to the right. Uh, and of course, that that is more effective on clay, which takes spin more than grass. So maybe that's one reason he was better on clay. But uh, both he and Budge were just all court players. They would they had great baseline rallies, but anything short, they'd come right to net and had great volleys. Hmm. So yeah, a, a little more background here. Before Budge was considered to be the best in the world, another American, Bill Tilden, held that distinction. But he and the United States Lawn Tennis Association, the ruling body of American tennis at the time, they didn't get along. And Tilden wound up coaching the German team. What happened? How did he end up doing that? Yeah, well, Bill Tilden was the face of American tennis for 10 years. I mean, through the 20s, he completely ruled tennis. Um, he was just an incredible, incredible player. Uh, one year, 1924, he didn't lose a single match. And um, he won the Davis Cup for the U.S. almost single-handedly. Wow. Six incredible. or seven years in a row. Incredible. Just an incredible player. However, he was a very unusual personality. For one thing, he also was gay. And, uh, and of course, also kept that very secret. Although, you know, players knew it. The USLTA knew it. Um, and he wasn't just a gay, but he had this uh, predilection for underage boys. Uh, he, and so the USLTA was very nervous the whole time that he was the face of American tennis, that there was going to be some sort of scandal and, you know, bring the tennis world crashing down. Uh, he also had a very imperious personality. Uh, he'd walk into a room and just take command and tell, tell everyone what to do. And I'm sure he was constantly telling tennis officials what to do. And uh, so not, you know, he wasn't always the most popular guy around, although he had a very magnetic personality. Um, but the USLTA was quite pleased, I think, or relieved, I should say, when he finally retired from amateur tennis in 1930 when he was 37 and, and he began playing professional tennis. Um, and he he very much wanted to coach the American team. You know, he he loved American tennis, and but they, uh, year after year, turned him down. They didn't want him coaching their boys. So... He had been playing a lot in Germany as a pro and felt very comfortable there. Uh, as you said, in the 20s, Germany was a, 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 specifically Berlin, was a very, felt like a very safe haven for homosexuals. Uh, and he was very comfortable there and had become good friends with von Kram. And in uh, 1936, he, uh, he finally offered, he said, you know, he offered to coach the German team. And uh, they couldn't have him as an official coach, you know, because that wouldn't look right, especially under the Nazi regime. But they did hire him as an unofficial coach. Um, so he was not the official team captain or coach, but he worked with them in practices, and he was at this big match uh, between Crom and Budge and watching in the stands and, you know, clearly rooting for Crom, his, his pupil. How did, how did his, or what did he do to help the German team? What kind of advice, coaching, did he actually do, and, and for von Crom as well? Well, I don't know specifically about coaching the team, but I'm sure he was an invaluable resource. I mean, he was he was not just a great player, but known as a great uh, sort of philosopher of tennis. He'd written a number of books. He, he fancied himself a literary man as well. He wrote he actually wrote fiction about tennis, but he also wrote several books uh, of tennis instruction. And he had he came up with certain theories about tennis that lasted for many years, really through the wood racket era. Um, but uh, it, it, it specifically he helped von Krom a lot in a personal way. He really helped develop helped develop his backhand, uh, just as he himself had finally become world champion by finally uh, developing a strong backhand, turning the weakness into a strength. Uh, he did very much the same for von Krom. So uh, von Krom had always always grateful to him and considered him a great uh, mentor. Your book really delves into a lot of different topics, including how the Davis Cup came about. How did the Davis Cup come about? Yeah, <laughs> well, Dwight Davis and uh, his friends were students at Harvard 
right around the turn of the century, around 1900 or just before, and they fell in love with this new sport of lawn tennis, which was really invented in 1883. So it was quite a new sport. Uh, it, it had been evolved. It evolved from some uh, previous games, which were sort of indoor tennis sports or racket sports. But the, the lawn tennis, which is the game we know, uh, was was only uh, 15 years old when they started playing it, and they became great enthusiasts at Harvard, and and they uh, decided to challenge England to a team competition. The uh, U.S. and England were really the only two countries at that time that it was there was a lot of tennis being played. So they uh, just started this competition, and Davis was quite wealthy, and he he purchased this very ornate cup and to make a to use as a trophy, you know, and they just. And the amazing thing is that the Davis Cup, all through these years, even as it's played today, is basically the same format that they started in 1901, which was, you know, uh, uh, two singles matches, three out of five sets, then uh, a one doubles match, and then reverse singles. You know, huh. two players play switch, switch order. And um, so it's best of five matches. And amazingly, that format has survived all this time. How... How are the Davis Cup matches set up? I mean, it's it's it, it, the Davis Cup takes almost a year to play. How is the whole tournament set up, and how are how is it determined which country plays which country? Yeah, well, it's just a tournament. You know, it's a team tournament, but it's it's handled like any other tournament. They have a draw. You know, they pull out of a hat. I mean, they have seeds, but then they have a draw. And uh, the only difference is that each round is, in, or the rounds are separated by months. So, you know, they play the first round in January or February, and then a couple months later, another round. And, and uh, finally, um, well, this is the way it is now, anyway. The finals are finally played in end of November, I think, or mid November, um, or maybe even December. But uh, back then, the finals were, you know, there wasn't really indoor tennis, and uh, the finals were wrapped up in the summer. So, um, and also, it was a little different then because, um, and this was also done at Wimbledon until 1922, but um, is they call it challenge round, where the defending champion only plays the final round. Wow. And so all the, challenge, the challengers all play a tournament, and the winner of them plays the final championship match against the defending ch- champ. And the interesting thing in 1937, when the, my book takes place, is that England was the defending champion because they had had Fred, the great Fred Perry who had helped them win the Davis Cup. But he had just turned pro, so he could no longer play Davis Cup. So England really had no chance, even though they were the defending champion. And so it really, when it came down to uh, the U.S. versus Germany, that was the finals of the challengers, or what they call the interzone tournament. <laughs> so this was not actually the championship round, but everyone knew that whoever won this round would easily beat England, and that is what happened. Right. So if for all intents and purposes... This match and 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 the, and the match but the tie between U.S. and Germany was at two matches each when Budge and Crom took the court for the fifth and deciding match. So it really was that one match for the whole Davis Cup that year. And what a match it was! And winning the Davis Cup and you sort of referenced this early on would have been huge for the Germans, and that's why they allowed von Krom to continue to play despite his background. And this would have been huge because, especially for Hitler, as he tried to prove that the Aryan race was a superior race. How big what? I mean, I just can't imagine they let all this go with Gottfried von Krom as long as he would win. Yeah, I mean it is it is surprising, uh, but you know the Nazis weren't as uh, I don't know it's I don't know what the word to use is, but because obviously they were incredibly strict, but they in some ways they would let their ideals uh, be bent a little when they wanted certain things. For instance, although they uh, despised homosexuals, Hitler early on had one of his right hand men, you know, who was a very well known homosexual, stay in as his right hand man until. So Himmel came along. Himmler came along and um, and got rid of him. But uh, in this case, it was very, very important for them to excel at sports on a national, international level. And so that really, you know, they were willing to bend rules and bend their ideals a bit to get that done. 
On Sports Forgotten Heroes, we always cover our hero's career. But in this instance, I'm just going to focus really on this one match because it really defines who Gottfried von Krom was and the kind of tennis player he was. And just one other thing before we get into that match, that incredible match. A lot of dignitaries, and you said this the last time that you were on, a lot of dignitaries followed Don Budge wherever he went. And there were a lot of dignitaries in the stands that day for this match. Who were some of the people that came over from the U.S. and elsewhere to watch this incredible Davis Cup match between Don Budge and Gottfried von Krom? Yeah, well, there were um, uh, tennis players were pretty popular um, in Hollywood in those days. Hollywood uh, uh, tennis was a big sport out there. Charlie Chaplin had his own court and often had the great tennis stars to his house to play, including including Till Lynn and Budge and Gene Mako um, and other people like Douglas Fairbanks and Errol Flynn were very into tennis. Um, there were several Hollywood stars that had come over to watch uh, Budge in the match. Uh, and and also there were just a lot of people there who maybe didn't specifically come to watch Budge, but people like James Thurber, the great New Yorker writer, he was in England and covering the match uh, for the New Yorker. Um, Ralph Bunch, the, the uh, later to be the uh, Secretary of the UN and Nobel Peace Prize winner, he was in England and at the match. Uh, there was just all these a whole group of celebrities there. It was a very very big deal, uh, um, a little bit unlike it is today, but. That was a huge, huge event. And on the other side, there were quite a few dignitaries, or at least there were some dignitaries from the German side as well. Uh, dignitaries, uh, at least when you're talking about the Gestapo, Hitler's, uh, you know, s- stormtroopers. There were yeah. people there who, uh, yeah, we're, I'm calling them dignitaries, but they're really not dignitaries. They were just high-ranking officials in Hitler's exactly, army. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were a number of Nazi officials at the match, and sitting in the royal box with the Queen. In fact, Queen Mary was there, which is very unusual for a match not involving England. Um, and then, you know, it's just an interzone final. In fact, the interzone final was would you normally have been played on court one, um, but because it was such a big deal this year, they put it on center court. And uh, yeah, the Queen was there with her entourage and Nazi officials and American officials and just a lot of. In fact, the Nazi flag was flying over center court along with the American and British flags. It's incredible to think that something like that could have happened. Man, that guy really did pull the wool over the world's eyes at that particular time. Nobody knew what he was about to do. Yeah, um, well, I think some people did, but the public really didn't. Um, And as you said, the German fans were, I mean, the, the British fans were rooting for... The German player, uh, there's several reasons for that, actually. I mean, one is that the German aristocracy, I'm sorry, the British aristocracy was quite pro-Germany, even at this, even in 1937. Uh, there were quite a few sympathizers um, for Hitler at that time. Uh, of course, it's changed a couple years later, but it was also true in the United States. You know, the upper classes in the United States were, were pro-German at this time. And um, so, yeah, people were not yet all <laughs> aligned against Nazi Germany. Uh, the other reason, though, that England fans were rooting, tennis fans were rooting for Krom, is that they didn't think they didn't think England had too much of a chance in the final round, but they thought they'd have a better chance against Germany than against Don Budge, who seemed to be unbeatable. So they were hoping that somehow von Krom could pull off an upset, and then maybe England would have a chance in the final round. And he almost did. So let's get to that match. Von Krom got off to a great start. He won the first two sets before Budge finally broke him. Talk about the first Mm -hmm. two sets. Yeah, well, you know, everyone was thinking it was going to be all Budge. Budge had just beaten him in three straight sets two weeks ago. Really quick match. But uh, this was a very different Krom today. He came out very inspired and just played the match of his life. And it was very, very... A tight first set. People couldn't believe it. You know, went uh, to eight six, but he finally broke through and won, and won the second. So it was just he was just playing what some people called super tennis at the time. <laughs> you know, he was just on his game and playing fantastic. And Budge must have been a bit surprised. You know, even though you learn as a player to play every match, take every match seriously, and play as hard as you can, when you go out to play someone who you just destroyed, 
on the same court two weeks ago, you, you have to feel a little pretty confident. So I think, you know, he probably didn't quite come out fiery enough and suddenly realized he was in a huge battle. Do you think that being up two sets to love gave Von Krom not a sense of invincibility, but a sense of, I got this. This is, <laughs> There's no way I'm about to lose yeah. or that I can lose this match. Well, you know, um, I, probably I wouldn't go that far because, you know, tennis players, they're all athletes. I think they're trained that if when you get up, you know, you keep your killer instinct and you, you just never, never think you got it won, right? You always got to keep the pressure on. But on the other hand, they're human. So we do see even today in the in pro tennis, I mean, I'm always amazed when players ease up after they're ahead or, or you know, or you're choking a big point. You think someone at that level would never, would be the kind of person who would never choke, right? But you still see it. They're human beings. So sure, I'm sure there was some element of that. Um, I, I think probably... A bigger factor was that Budge just set his jaw and, you know, determined to come back because, you know, Crom didn't really start playing worse. I think but Budge came on very strong to win the next two sets, uh, at which point you would think he would then have the momentum and run away with the fifth, but that's not quite what happened. Yeah, so let's go back to the third set. How did the tide yeah. finally start to change in Budge's favor? What was Budge able to do differently or what did Von Krom do differently that allowed Budge to sneak back into the match? Um, yeah, well, I think he finally realized that maybe he had been a little bit uh, lax or a little bit uh, less aggressive than he normally was, maybe thinking that he was going to win too easily. And he finally realized he's going to have to take control. And when, one of the things he did was start taking Von Krom's serve on the rise, uh, Krom had a great twist serve, which bounced high, but on grass, it doesn't have as much effect. And Krom, Budge was able to take it on the rise and get to net. And he started rushing the net a lot more, playing a lot more aggressively, I think. And uh, I think that was probably because he suddenly realized, you know, this is not going to be a cakewalk. I got to take control and do something, not just stand around. And Von Krom still, though, controlled the match. He got up four games to one in the fifth and final set. Yeah. How does one overcome that? How does Don Budge say, you know what? I still got a shot. I, I just can't imagine the psychology that is in a world-class athlete's mind where they just don't fold up and say, well, it's over. How does, and, yeah. and in reverse, I mean, the shock on Von, that Von Krom must have felt when Budge finally comes back and Von Krom had all these championship points and couldn't put him away. Yeah, it was an amazing set. Well, we know when Krom got up 4-1, the announcers and the fans all thinking that it's over. And in fact, uh, famously, Bill Tilden stood up in the stands. Apparently. I was just going to go there. <laughs> Yeah, and he turned to uh, the, the the German team uh, and gave him the the uh, OK sign, like it's in the bag, you know. And uh, some of the Americans who were there, some of the uh, actually some of the American actors were got very angry. Paul Lucas, in particular, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Ed were, Sullivan, Ed Sullivan, you Ed were Ed Sullivan about. was ready to charge him and um, and had to be held back. <laughs> At least that's how the legend goes. Um, but the fact is, you know, from Budge's point of view. You're down. You're serving at one four in the set. It's not so dire as it may seem to the to the casual fan. He's down one break. You know, especially on grass, people generally hold their serve, and you try to get a break of serve uh, to win. You know, a set. But he's down one four. It's one break. He'll, uh, if he if he holds a serve, he's got to break him back, and then if he holds a serve again, you're even. So one four to tennis players is not that big a deal. You know, certainly you don't want to be down one four in the yeah. fifth set yeah. of a big match. Uh, and I'm sure Crown was feeling very confident. All he had to do was hold his serve three more times to win the match. But you know, when you're down, you got to look at it positively. And I think Budge was a very confident young man, and he said, "That's fine. I'm just going to break back." You know, so that's what he did. He 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 held serve. He played a great game to break back. And then held, and they're all even. Uh, and then it was, you know, just going back and forth to the bitter end. And as you say, um, a lot of match points for Von Krom, and he saved a bunch himself. And um, 
you know, it's just an amazing set. Does that also talk to how far above everybody else Dom Budge was here? Von Krom is solidly the number two player in the world and would be number one if not for Don Budge, but yet Budge was just that much better. Does that, does, is this match sort of a microcosm of just how much better Don Budge was than the rest of the tennis world at that time? Or was yeah. there something to do with the pressure that Von Krom was facing, knowing that, man, if I lose this match, my life might really change for the worse? Well, the uh, impressive thing for Von Krom is that despite an incredible pressure, um, and that's really why I call this in my book the greatest tennis match ever. There have been other amazing matches in history, but... This one had more riding on it, I think, than any other tennis match. Sure. And with all that, all that pressure on him, both from the nation and the team, and also him personally, he played the greatest match of his life, really. Um, so he, he, you know, when he looked back, he had nothing to feel regretful about in the way he played. I think he played great tennis all the way to the end. But um, uh, as you say, Budge really was, without question, the greatest player, and it allowed him to come back. Uh, um, so. You know, I mean, uh, in this match, Budge was just barely better. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> overall, he was unquestionably the world's number one. And, and that I think in his, he knew that in his mind. That's probably what allowed him to come back. Talk about how Von Krom learned the game of tennis. If I recall in reading your book, he was a member of a particular tennis club there, and his game got stronger and stronger and stronger. Tell me about his upbringing and how he became so good at tennis. Yeah, well, he grew up on a, a mansion, or, you know, actually, they had a family at three different mansions uh, in the outskirts of uh, Hamburg. And his dad had bu- built a court, a nice red clay court on their estate, and that's when he got into it as a boy. And um, his dad would bring in uh, tennis pros and or great amateurs from Berlin to visit, and they would, ha- they would help him out a bit, you know, teach him a little bit. And... Um, he was a very good player, and then he decided he just wanted to be, you know, the greatest player in the world. And he moved to Berlin when he was 18 or so and um, began playing at the Rotweiss Tennis Club, the Red White Club, which is the finest club in Germany. And all the great German champions had played there. And that's when he really started training hard and, <laughs> and uh, became a great player. And there was a, uh, the Germany's number one player at that time was Daniel Prenn, who was a, a Jew a Russian Jew who had emigrated after the Russian Revolution. And uh, they became friends and doubles partners and they played together on the Davis Cup team in like 1931, 32. And Germany came very close with the two of them playing, although von Kron was not yet at his peak. Um, But then when Hitler came into power, uh, the Jews were banned from sports teams and Prenn emigrated to England. So von Kron was left on his own there. And although he became a much greater player after that, he never quite had the partner like Prem, and so they never did quite win it. Hmm, interesting. That last point was an incredible point. Budge, yeah. he miraculously returns this deep and wide shot by Von Krom, and yeah. he wins that match. Can you tell me a little bit more about that point, what you recall from everything you won and what the atmosphere was, uh, from everything that you had read? And what the atmosphere was like when Budge finally came all the way back to beat Gottfried von Krom and win that Davis Cup match? Yeah, well, as you know, Budge had broken back to even the match. It had gone back and forth till six all, no tiebreakers, you know. So then he was, he finally broke von Krom and then served for the match. And um, von Krom saved, I, I think, four match points in a row with some incredible shots. And now right. this was the fifth match point. And they had a long rally from the baseline, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, Von Krom got a short ball and hit it deep to way over, over to Budge's forehand. Because Budge was very famous for his backhand, his incredible backhand. Um, but he had him moved over to the left and hit it deep to the forehand, and Budge went running across. And as he recalled, that he just sprinted all the way across and, with his last bit of strength, he kind of lunged at the ball and hit it as hard as he could and actually fell down 
under the grass in his uh, in his after throw after um, you know after hitting the stroke, uh, he kind of tumbled under the grass and didn't really see where it landed, but he he heard the cheers of the crowd and knew that he had hit a winner to win wow. the match. Wow! Wow! Really, one of the great one of the great closing moments ever. Yeah. And if Von Krom had been able to get to that ball with Budge on the ground, it's a completely different yeah. outcome. Yeah, then they're still playing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the two had quite the embrace afterwards, and then their lives really took dramatic turns, particularly yeah. the life of Von Krom. In no particular order, we talked about some of this earlier, he was arrested for moral turpitude, jailed, shamed, fought for his country against Russia, suffered an awful case of frostbite, became part of a resistance that tried to assassinate Hitler, finally was able to play tennis again free from worry, certainly an incredible life. What was life like for Gottfried von Krom after that match? Yeah, well, just um, as you just went through a lot of it, but, you know, um, he had an incredible perseverance, and he he uh, came back to fight for his country. He survived the war. He survived the Holocaust, and uh, he actually came back and played for Germany after the war when he was in his forties. Played Wimbledon one more time, um, and then he became the later became the head of West German tennis after the war. He was the head of the West German Tennis Federation for a number hmm. of years. Interesting. And uh, and had a very successful business life and just a very, you know, had a very successful life. Uh, he also, there's another side story about him, which is that the, the Woolworth heiress, Barbara Hutton, was just obsessed with him in the 30s and <laughs> she very much in love with him. And uh, he, he finally married her um, after the war. And they, for a couple of years, uh, around 1950 or so, they were married. And uh, of course, that didn't last too long. She, well, she had a lot of problems of her own, and he was—he was not actually a heterosexual. So, right, yeah. right. Uh, that didn't last too long, but it's an interesting part of his life. And you know, but he ended up having a very—I uh, think—a relatively happy, stable life. And unfortunately, died in his sixties um, in a car crash. But uh, but it's a remarkable, remarkable success story after all he had been through. Yeah, he was sort of um, a philanthropist, I guess, as well. I mean, he did well financially, and he helped yeah. as many of his friends as he could. Tell me about how much he cared for his friends and what he did for them. I mean, getting money out of the country for them. Again, the definition of a hero. Yeah, well, he'd done that for his friend uh, during the war, his Jewish uh, friend. And um, he also, uh, th th there was a... Um, I think a pilot uh, he uh, who was down, an American pilot who he harbored at his mansion during the war. I mean, some amazing things he did. Uh, he was just a very, very magnanimous and, and heroic sort and um, was very generous, incredibly generous with his money as well. It's true. I guess when you use the term hero, and this podcast uses the term hero in its title... When you consider everything Gottfried von Krom faced and the fact that he even tried to assassinate Hitler, he was truly a hero, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, he is actually quite well known in Germany to this day, um, although not, not so much outside, um, which I, you know, I tried to correct that a bit with, with my book and hopefully uh, uh, brought him a little bit back to the, to the public uh, sense. But uh, he was certainly one of the great, He's one of the great figures in sports history, no question about it. Why should we care here in the United States? Why should we care about who Gottfried von Krom was, and how should we remember him? Well, I think he's a, he was a throwback to a time when sportsmanship was really more important than anything. I mean, at least to him it was. <laughs> here he had, had had a lot of frustrations in his career, not quite being able to hit it, make it to number one, and... But he had no regrets. He he always said that the most important thing in in tennis or in sport was fair play. That was a sort of famous quote of his. And um, you know, I think for a while that kind of was forgotten in tennis. Uh, but it seems like these days, in a way, it's come back. Uh, you see a lot of very fine sportsmanship these days among, especially among the men uh, tennis players. And uh, I think you know the legacy of Von Krom and other great players, uh, great sportsmen, is, is seen there. 
But uh, he should, I think, Von Kron will always be remembered, or hopefully will be remembered, as uh, just one of the great, great figures in, in tennis history, you know, for his sportsmanship, his elegance, his incredible play, and all the things he went through in his personal life. Yeah, even the fact that he went and fought for his country, even though yeah. he knew, or he eventually knew, man, this is yeah. not right. This, 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 this is isn't right. Yeah. Yeah, this is something hard for us to maybe understand. I mean, he detested, absolutely detested the government, but he loved his country. Uh, maybe that is something people can relate to today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but you know, he, in a time of war, he voluntarily came back and fought and almost gave his life for his country, even though it was being run by a government that had tried to, to you know, get rid of him. So, <laughs> And then the people he loved. So it was just a quite amazing time and Quite an amazing person. Yeah, quite a different time. Quite a different time for tennis as well. And when you look back at it for a moment, Don Budge, the game was regarded much differently than it is today. I mean, can you imagine a parade down Broadway today for a tennis player or, you know, yeah. for a Davis Cup victors? I Absolutely. can't. And, and that's what yeah. happened. <laughs> I, I yeah. mean, talk to me about the parade. I mean, how how was tennis just viewed so differently? Well, you know, there were fewer sports back then uh, overall, and uh, certainly fewer international sports. And so, the tennis was was quite popular. You know, and it was it was a big thing. And then in tennis, the Davis Cup was supreme. So, you know, Davis Cup matches were front page stories, uh, especially when the U.S. was doing well. Um, it was a huge thing. It's it's yeah, it's hard to imagine. There's there's no there was no Super Bowl. There was no March Madness. There was no, you know there's a yeah. there's a, a a lot fewer sports events uh, to take up people's minds, and and so the Davis Cup was one of the real big ones. So that match, which wasn't for a championship, it's not very well known, and yet, as you say, and I think it's a great argument, can be considered if not the greatest match ever played, one of the greatest matches ever played. What made it so significant? Obviously, well, why did you decide to write about it? What was it that, how did you discover it? Why write about it? Well, I, you know, when I was growing up playing tennis, uh, my brother and I had all these books on tennis, and a lot of them would talk about, you know, the greatest matches ever. (laughs) And all those lists, uh, this was always the number one match. It was the greatest match ever played. You know, it was sort of famous for that. This is in the 70s. So this is before Borg and McEnroe and Federer and Nadal, of course. But at that time, just for the tennis, with no and no one ever mentioned, none of these articles or stories ever mentioned Von Krom's personal life or any of that, when he, things he was going through or the fact that Tilden was coaching. You know, It was just about the tennis. It was a long, for a long time considered the greatest match ever. And then I was looking, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I was looking around for a new book to write, and I was interested in Tilden. And uh, uh, I found there was a very good biography already of him by Frank DeFord. But and reading that book, though, it just mentioned very briefly that Tilden was coaching the Germans in that famous match between Von Kram and Budge. And I just couldn't believe it. You know, I'd never heard that anywhere. Uh-huh. And I started started researching what was going on and, and learned about Von Kram and who I had known nothing about and learning all about him and his personality and the struggles he faced and then learning about how Tilden had been coaching them. And it just, it just became sort of an obvious story that had to be told. Like not, none, none of the tennis histories ever mentioned, well, really you never even saw his, uh, Kram's homosexuality mentioned at all. Right. And, um, and certainly not what he had gone through personally and the pressure he was under and, and Tilden coaching them. So all this was, had not been told. And so I really thought everything was just coming together into this like, perfect story with all these great, great side personal stories behind this famous match. For you, while writing the book, what was the most fun thing and or what was the most surprising thing that you discovered while writing this book? Well, I, I loved researching. I, mean, I just loved delving into all these old tennis magazines and memoirs by people. I kept finding different people who mentioned this match uh, in their memoirs. They had been there, you know, I ended up with this whole supporting cast of famous people who happened to be in the stands on that day. That's what I Um, found. It's just incredible. All the people that, that I guess 
partook in this match. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, and so that, to me, that was the most fun thing is finding all these different personalities that, that converged on this one point, this one place and time uh, in which so much was being contested, not just tennis. Marshall, are you working on anything else? What are some of the other books you've uh, you've written that uh, fans of Sports Forgotten Heroes might be interested in? Oh, uh, well, since the, since the Terrible Splendor, I, I published a novel, uh, which was about a tennis instructor. So <laughs> that uh, some, you know, people who like tennis might like that as well. That's called The Backhanded Gift. And then uh, most recently, I finished a book also involving tennis. Uh, it's also a novel, though, but it's about the writer Vladimir Nabokov, the author of Lolita and other great novels. Uh-huh. And it's about him. It's about him when he was very young. Uh, so it also involves Germany because he was a Russian exile from the he was a, a Russian aristocrat in exile in Berlin in the 20s when he met his wife, Vera, and he was a very fine tennis player. So I've written a book about the two of them um, around the time they met and also involving a, a third fictional character from a tennis player from the U.S. who meets them both. And so it all sort of takes place in Berlin in 1922, 23, um, in the Russian community in Berlin. Sounds like a lot of fun, like you have a lot of fun writing these books. Where can people find your work? Oh, yeah, just look it up, Google it, you know, certainly Amazon and, and other, hopefully hopefully your local bookstore, too. <laughs> you just look, look up, uh, you'll find them online. Yeah. Marshall, thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes once again. Really enjoyed our conversation. You're a terrific writer, and I just hope that the people – uh, listening to Sports Forgotten Heroes, pick up your book, A Terrible Splendor. It's really an in-depth, fun read, and a great accounting of what a, a terrific match and what a great match it was between Don Budge and a truly forgotten hero, a guy who became the number two tennis player in the world, Gottfried von Krom. Marshall, thank you so much. Thanks, Warren. It was my pleasure. Over the course of his career, Von Krom won 390 matches and lost 82. Overall, he won 45 tournaments and at one point was ranked number one in the world. Twice he won the French Open, 1934 and 1936. He played in three Wimbledon finals and one U.S. Open final. He was a part of two doubles teams that won major championships, the 1937 French and the 1937 U.S. Open, and he won a mixed doubles major as well, the 1933 Wimbledon. But what he did to help those who fled Germany and the fact that he actually fought on the front lines for his home country and was a part of a group that tried to eliminate or assassinate Hitler certainly contributes to his standing of what a hero is all about. I'd like to thank my guest today, Marshall John Fisher, for a wonderful conversation and for sharing so much about Gottfried von Krom. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back at one of the pioneers of the NBA, one of the greats to have ever played the game, Dolph Shades. Thanks again for joining me, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday's Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.